not setting ourselves up as uh, know-it-alls at all about music, but I happen to be a, a fiddler of some experience, and uh, I got acquainted with Gordon uh, in 1976, just about the time of the bicentennial, a little before, and we've hit it off very well since then. And we've, uh, we've had a lot of nice experiences, really, since we got to know each other. Am I talking loud enough? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we've been to various inter very interesting places in those three years. And uh, it won't be four years until April if we got to know each other. Now, I played with a lot of people uh, uh, all over this area for a long time, but I haven't actually got to play with anybody to the length of at for a length of time that we've got in such good accord as Gordon. And I very much like his guitar player. And we will, we work out our tunes very carefully and try to do things like we like to hear them done. And uh, I'll, I've got part of a prepared talk here that I'll read to you, but I may talk to you. And any time you want to interrupt, please, please do it. My interest in music is mostly instrumental, mainly because I can't sing one little bit. I've been a student of fiddle music for many years, and I grew up in a musical family. I've been interested in all phases of fiddle music from the standpoint of its origins and, and in the way it's developed. In recent years, the musical electronics, that is, tape recorders and recordings of all kinds, have been a big boost to fiddling, as well as all other types of music. As far as written music is concerned, fiddling is, an, is in, in entirely another world. You ask a fiddler if he can read music, he'll say, well, not enough to spoil my fiddling. And uh, that's pretty much true. Uh, I know people who are excellent classical musicians and who would give their right arm to be able to play a fiddle again. That sounds funny, but and anything is, uh, where a fiddle tune is written is, even if the person can execute it perfectly by reading it and transferring it to his violin, uh, it just is not done right. I have a question. All right. Is there a difference outside of the name between a fiddle and a violin? I always sort of call fiddle. No. I've got something in my next paragraph here about that. This is not in here. Uh, it's fascinating to see and hear a musician who can read and has enough of a natural ear to combine both playing by ear and, and reading rapidly. Of course, one who's been trained in music does have an advantage, but at the same time, that person can never play a fiddle tune with the ease and feeling that it can be played by a country fiddler. Many people ask, what is the difference between the violin and the fiddle? Of course, there is no difference. In fact, the word fiddle, fiddle was being used long before the word violin was used. So don't feel you're being a little crude to call it fiddle. It's really a fiddle before it was a violin. And the fiddle music that we know now has its beginnings through two or three different channels. Most likely, we're, when we hear a tune in this area, we can assume that it came to us in a roundabout way from the British Isles. Mainly it arrived here by way of the Appalachian area because the early people of that region, like Kentucky, Tennessee, and the Carolinas, came to this area as the westward surge began. People, uh, ever since this nation is founded, it's, there's been a movement of, for the restless to get a little bit farther west and get a little bit better land or some land that's pretty much like the land he grew up with. That, funny thing about uh, immigration, that is immigration in this country. So many people, when they uh, left where they were and got to another place, they were looking for the kind of land they lived on. They were looking for uh, woods and springs and uh, uh, farming land and rich land. And uh, of course, most of the time then there wasn't any replacement of the fertilization of, of land and no fertilizer. They, they wore the land out. 
They used, used it up on tobacco. They used it up on corn. And pretty soon, they couldn't replenish it if the crops began to fail, so they went west. And that's the reason that we get fiddle tune through the British influence. We can also pretty well be assured that the tune has a Scottish or an Irish or even an English origin. And you can be pretty well assured that the tune originated in some type of dancing. Now, we can't get around the natural fact that all people are innately rhythmic or they respond to rhythm. It's just as natural for you to pat your foot when you hear the band playing or the fiddler play or anything that's got a beat to it. And uh, the people who really enjoy themselves hearing music are the ones that feel the rhythm so well. And uh, you, you get a good uh, uh, inkling of that in the uh, playing of jazz especially Dixieland jazz, the New Orleans type that you hear occasionally on Channel 21. You get some pretty good programs now and then. But uh, everybody likes to get that foot path going. And that's the basis of nearly all so-called old-time fiddling. Even a small baby will respond to a danceable beat, even to the point of doing something ridiculous. The baby will frantically do something to react to the beat probably a movement that can't seem to control. That's what I mean when I say the tune is an answer to a need for rhythm. That's what I really think the basis of, of uh, rhythmic music is. It's, it's an answer to something that's in you. Now, for several years, uh, and during some festivals at Silver Dollar City, I had a little group that we played down there. And thousands and thousands of tourists going through and carrying their babies and rolling them in drawers and all this stuff. Oh, was some baby inside of our station where we played that was just something. He wanted to do something so bad and uh, trying so hard. And that's just, just that natural and it's just that uh, early for the person to have it. Nowadays, we're much more aware of tunes that came from other areas in Great Britain. In eastern and southeastern Canada, we have situations a little bit like our own here area here, but it had a French influence mixed in with the British, and out of that came a different type of dance music. And also in other parts of the country, we have other nationalities of immigrants from other parts of Europe, such as the German, the Italian, or the Polish. In each case, the music in the New World is colored by the native songs and dances of the Old World. Now, you, a good example of that is to go up in the Dakotas, or Nebraska, where so many Eastern, Central Eastern Europeans came, the Poles and the uh, Czechoslovakians and all those. They have uh, a different kind of dance. You, you, the kind of music that is nowadays we know as a polka. It's fast and furious and they had it, uh, they, they used it in their festivals and their weddings and even at their funerals and their wakes. And they, they had two or three days to celebrate the wedding and two or three days to celebrate the passing of somebody. And it nearly all wound up with some pretty furious dancing. And that's that is an influence that we feel now. We hear polkas and marches a lot, which were from that area of the world. As I said before, the coming of the record and the tape recorder and the radio and the television has tended to spread the types to all peoples. And a young boy in the Ozarks now may become an excellent performer of a type of music that he never could have even heard 50 years ago. When I, thought, when I was a boy, I, I might have heard the fiddle tune once and I never have heard and never got the chance to hear it again. That man was gone. He, I saw him briefly made it. So if I learned to play it, I had to really be fast on the uptake or I faked part of it or even composed something that sounded all right to round out the tune. And that's one good thing about fiddling. Uh, no two fiddlers play alike. And that's good if everybody played tune uh, exactly like everybody else would be much interest to it. You, it shouldn't, you shouldn't be tired of it. Uh, Gordon and I go uh, one particular place that we go and have a wonderful time is Tahlequah, Oklahoma. A lot of good fiddlers in Oklahoma. Indian fiddlers, a lot of them. And, and uh, there's a type of music that has come up around that area and the panhandle of Texas 
and West Arkansas. And it's pretty typical. You, it's typical to the point nowadays that you say, oh, he's playing Texas style. And uh, anybody who's familiar with fiddling knows a Texas fiddler in a minute because he's, uh, he's, he's got a, a twist to it that nobody else has. <coughs> As I said, I, if I didn't learn the tune, I don't mean myself, anybody 50, 40, 50 years ago who tried to learn a new tune, he didn't have a chance to record it on a tape recorder and uh, play it back 25 times so he could memorize it. He had to learn it right then or else. Well, some of the versions of the same tune are good. Some of them bad and some of them just so-so, but very often fiddler will, you hear a fiddler say that he only caught part of the tune, he wants help with the rest of it. And that's why the fiddler like to get together and change the tune. Most old fiddle tunes were adapted to the type of dancing that was wanted or needed at that particular time. And as dancing crazies came out, there was music made to fiddle. For, for instance, now this is not necessarily uh, country fiddling, but the Charleston was a kind of dance that lent itself to a type of music. And people who, who uh, played Charleston music got, whenever that one of those tunes played, somebody wanted a Charleston. And there's a two-step and a one-step and a waltz and a shottish and so on, and various types of dancing. Square dancing probably had its best beginnings in France, where court dancing and other types of dancing for large groups were used. And when the Europeans came here, they brought that dancing with them for their wedding feasts and so on. In the United States, square dancing has been through a lot of changes, and now hundreds of couples can dance to, an, to amplified music and an amplified color, all in one big hall or gymnasium, and all all at the same time. Now, uh, in the 50s, there was a uh, rise in the interest of square dancing. And the type of dancing that you hear now, and if you look in Springfield paper, there's always a little place that so-and-so dances at such and such a hall, and so-and-so is going to call a dance, and so on. Uh, I remember a uh, little group I played when we played at the Drury Gym for a, uh, oh, I don't know, it must have been 56 or 7, somewhere in there. And uh, the place was just as full as it could be of dancers, one man calling over one mic and loudspeakers all over the place, and we were amplified. And of course, the first time choir dancing I ever saw was in, in somebody's dining room to pull the table out and roll up the rug or something and had uh, four couples or maybe at the most eight couples to do the square dancing there. And uh, that's where a lot, of, a lot of fiddling was learned and a lot of fiddling was practiced. Now, uh, uh, briefly I'm going to say a few things about the names of fiddle tunes. They're, they're rather weird names in one way of looking at it. People uh, named uh, a tune, for instance, uh, I heard John Jones play a fiddle tune, and I learned it, but I didn't hear him say the name of it. So what did it get to be to me? John Jones' fiddle tune. And that's a lot of tunes that are now in uh, uh, the records of the past are named for some particular person, like Mrs. So-and-so's Hornified, Mrs. So-and-so's Real, or uh, Patty O'Toole's Jig, mainly because he played it and nobody thought of the name of it. There's a lot of other ways that the tunes are named, like the days of the week and the months of the year, and uh, the type of music, so-and-so's waltz, and uh, a hornpipe is a, is a rather, well, it's a dance that's written, written uh, played for one person just to get out here and show off a little bit and see if he could dance it. It wasn't for a big group of persons. And later on there was a, a type of a fiddle tune called a reel, and that was usually played when a group of people was dancing. 
I'll play you in a little while. I'm going to play you some of these tunes. And uh, one of the very famous city tunes is uh, called Fisher's Horn Pie. And somebody named Fisher played it. Uh, what's the first tune that comes into your mind when you think of Fisher? I can't believe it. No, I was thinking there's one they always say first. Virginia Reel? No. Fox No. Orange Blossom Special is usually what you call Orange Blossom Special is just a show. I think Johnny Cash has made that more of a, some other kind of tune than that many people think of. It's a show-off tune, and whether it's a competition or a so-called fiddler's contest, they ban it. They won't even let it be played in competition because it's it's just exercise and acrobatics so yeah. and it's it's good tune but it's really better when it's sung by somebody like Johnny Cash who slows it down and sings it you know. can I ask one uh -huh. question here now that we're naming different fiddle tunes uh -huh. my uncle has attempted to play the fiddle for probably 50 60 years yeah. I say attempted because he's never never <laughs> done it but he played one tune over and over and over it's called, he calls it rubber dialing is there such a tune? Yeah. <laughs> well, you, 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 you couldn't prove it yeah. to me. I've tried, I've listened to that man. Well, it's, it's, it's a tune not recognizable. Came, right, it's not recognizable. It's a tune that came out, I'd say, in around 1930 or something, and it's just, uh, it's just, you know, it's a song, really. Of my rubber dolly, yeah, rubber dolly. Back when your communities were more isolated in the Ozarks, you might have only one fiddler in a community. Now, every community had a fiddler. Without doubt, it was a necessary part of the social life of that community was to have a fiddler. And no guitars, no banjos, or anything else. And they might have just one fiddler. He might know only two tunes. So when they danced all night, they danced all night to those two or three tunes. And uh, of course, it got to where the dance was the thing, not the, not the tune necessarily. And then when they wouldn't have any second instruments, maybe they had two fiddlers, but one fiddler would second another one by more or less accordion or whatever you call it, you know. And then there's another little system that was used that we never have done yet, but we we're going to try it one of these days. It's old timers used to, uh, I'd say you had one fiddler like that. He played the fiddle. Another man stood by him on his left side and, and took two knitting needles and he uh, hammered on a rhythm on the neck of the fiddle as he was playing it. It, it was just a beat, you know. And, you know, right, as, as he played the fiddle. And uh, some people were very good at it. They used to wise knitting needles or something similar to like that. Something that was rigid and just a beat on it. So we'll uh, play a few tunes and uh, Talk some more about it as we go along. Now that uh, pass out to you there. Uh, I I wrote that uh, I believe in '77, and it was published in the Ozark Mountaineer. And uh, the title of it kind of gives it away because uh, there was an element, and there still is an element in the country who still thinks it's very very wicked. And it conflicts very strongly with uh, some people's religion. I respect that. They have that. I, I wouldn't want to thrust it on them at all. And but in on the face of it, it's uh, it's a little bit ridiculous because uh, actually it it's not that bad a thing. Did that used to be a, a fairly serious? Uh yeah, you don't hear much about it anymore. No, you don't hear I much about it anymore. Much. But and, uh, and you remember in, in your fiddle playing lifetime when that was a there were people who kind of thought there was a little something too well, about you because yes. you played the fiddle. Well, yeah. And I tell you, uh, I, I played uh, one time at a group of refrigeration men here in town. They had their association meeting at a, at a place that was out on toward the Republic. Called a place called Dent's Dinner House. Then maybe some of you remember it, I don't know. But uh, it's been in the news. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I remember 
when we played uh, that day, somebody said, oh, let's, let's uh, make up a set and have a birthday. And uh, uh, somebody did. Somebody who knew that. Three or four people got together and they dropped their wild up on them. Some of them like you have called a few figures. And, they, and one woman who was the wife of the fellow who was playing the guitar with me would not let her little girl look at us. <laughs> she made a little girl in the back there. Did they have any purpose to do it? No, we're good. You know, I have no idea what they're doing. I didn't pass either around that. The wolf trap and this one, the St. Louis, these are the festivals they have. I don't know whether you're familiar with These are the National Council of the Traditional Arts, but that one's National Park at the Arch. And that one is the <laughs> in the National Council of Traditional Arts. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've heard of Channel 21, there's very often a, a concert showing the oh, you going to press this too much. Why not so good over there? Uh, <laughs> I don't want you to move without you knowing. Uh, there's been several things, including offers and other things like that, that have been held in Wolf Trap National Park, which is right out of Washington, D.C. And it's... Uh, uh, we uh, we were invited there last year too, and we we had a lot of fun there. And twice we played at the Arch in St. Louis, which is national park now. And uh, they had they have a smaller, a little bit smaller festival there. And uh, we have been there and played. And that's one of the two or three good. Now, the Arch the other night. Huh? That, have you ever been to that folk center at Mount View, Arkansas? Mount View? Really, have you? Really nice down there. Well, we played there several times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, one thing you're going to be surprised at, if you're the average person in this area, you'll think of Turkey in the Straw and Orange Blossom Special, and you're going to be surprised at the variety of tunes your old-time fiddlers play. The endless variety. And I'd say the average repertoire of one like ours is probably three, 350 tunes, something like that. I guess. I don't yeah. know. Probably. Maybe. But uh, I mentioned a while ago this hornpipe, this the Fisher's hornpipe. Now that's the dance where somebody usually, you have a vision of somebody who's an old seaman come in off the uh, uh, void and he's in and he's uh, drinking pretty thoroughly and he's having a good time. He likes to, he hears some good rhythm, he likes to dance it. And that's what a hornpipe was, it's sort of a single person dance, but I'll play you a preacher's hornpipe. <laughs> record they have of that is a book published by a man named F-I-S-H-A-R in 1760. And they don't know if it was his or older, but they named it Fisher's Hornpipe. And it's still popular in Europe and the British Isles and really hasn't changed that much. So it's one that stayed pretty much the same. You'll hear that in Canada, all over. Yeah. Well, let's see. I'll play you a tune that has an Irish sound to it. it we found out when we were up the Wolf Trap that uh, we were up there with a group of Irish fiddlers. And they didn't play it as, as uh, being a tune native to Ireland. 
but it's probably come up through Irish immigrants into this country. But it sound, has an Irish sound to it, and it, it's kind of a pretty piece. And we, we like to play it. We play it at uh, Mountain View every time. I uh, really like it down there. <laughs> people came this way and they're 200 years apart and yet the tunes were the same. But there were numerous tunes that were almost a little bit different. I'll play another waltz called uh, uh, this probably had its origins uh, maybe in this country maybe not. Of course there's a lot of tunes that have come up since uh, that that are imitative in nature, that is, you've got, I'll play a tune in a minute that, uh, of my own that uh, is typical of, of, uh, of a fiddle tune, but I'll just play it next. It's, it's just called, it's a reel, it's called a Sunday Night Reel, and I just have to propose it on Sunday night. <laughs> Thank you. 
Those are usually a pretty fair indication of Irish and Scots background. Lots of miners. The Irish have lots of miners. In fact, they'll play whole tunes in minor keys. Uh, here's a tune that some of you I probably will recognize, and I'll play you the minor part first. You remember what I Oh, yeah. yeah. If, I can, if I can start in the middle. I think when you get into the chorus of this, you'll probably recognize it. Now, the thing about these, lots of tunes were much longer than they are now. You used to have two, three, four parts with it with radio and television and then fiddle contests, they were too long, so they left off the old... Every one of you in this room knows this song. I'd be interested to know if anybody knows what this tune is by the time we get ready to start the main part. Of it. If you, David, you won't, probably won't remember the first part of it, because it's very seldom played, but uh, later you will. Surely nobody does it, nobody. <laughs> Truman's tune, Truman, Harry Truman's tune, Missouri Boy. That's the actual thing, the Uh huh, yeah. In fact, there was a book published about Pendergast called Missouri Waltz back in the early 40s, and he already had it out on the uh, market, and the, the owners of the copyright of Missouri Waltz sued them for a million dollars. So they took it back, had to take them all off the market, and they put it back out as Milligan's story or something. That was the guy that had written. They had a multi-million dollar lawsuit over there because they used it. Now here's something you probably recognize too. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a jig, so-called jig, and it's very often played in Ireland. And because they play, they'll sit down, six of them that haven't seen each other in 10 years, and they'll play exactly the same notes. They're readers, they're all readers. That's what they call a person who can read music. And they take great pride in playing the music exactly the way John O'Donnell did it or so-and-so. But it gets awfully monotonous. If we played nothing but hornpipes all evening, you'd get tired of it because they go on and on and on. They repeat themselves over and over and over. There's no end to them. So what they do is change keys. They're right in the middle of it, just about. Wyden's quick step, I'd say. Oh, it's, not, it's not an Irish tune, I don't think, but it, it, it'll show you the difference of changing the keys. And
it's all together different now. That's just another way to vary the monotony of the name. Because it dances you play them over and over and over until either you quit or they wear down. Uh, some of them don't wear down. Just go on. I used to play for quite a few square dances, and there's there's always some knucklehead, I don't think they call him like that, that uh, gets to, he's, the, he's the caller, and he's pretty well pleased with himself. He may be a little bit inflamed with some of the great too, but he's uh, he likes to uh, get going. He, he, it's hard for him to stop. Well, a fiddler could just plainly fall on his face. You know, and, uh, this never dawns on this fellow. But, but it, it's just, you can go on forever. And I always like to quit him right in the middle of it because you, you can go so far and then you're, you're out. Let's see. I'll play another. To, uh, uh, I'm a little bit lazy. I like to play waltzes. And, uh, this is a uh, one that changes keys inside too. It's uh, what's the name of that? Uh, Kiss me, Walt. <laughs> I have such a terrible ear for 
music in there. Not much. Well, I like this. I have a terrible ear. Have you have you played turkey in the straw? No, but I will. Even the French over in the French mines area, you have a, over here around old mines, and that's they, they're still French over there, and they they play a French fiddle type of music, mm -hmm. but they even played this tune, and uh, this is one your grandfather played one at Flowers of Edinburgh. Flowers of Edinburgh. I've yeah, got it's, a, it's a, of course, uh, over the name of it is Scotland. I ran across a story just a few weeks ago. I have an, an old book just before the Battle of Wilson Creek. There was a woman came to General Lyon. She had her little boy with her and wanted to be a drummer boy. 
And uh, so to find out if he's qualified, he called his piper in. And he, the story says he played the most difficult tune he knew for a drummer to follow was the Flowers of Edinburgh. But this tune goes way back. And that's got if you'll notice Gordon's guitar. Well, don't, know this, don't know this Gordon's guitar, because it probably makes Very mistakes. pretty uh, minor chords in it. typical of Bob Will, but uh, you hear this deep. I'll play this a little bit of that.
40s and 50s. Let's see, let's play a little bit of a... Most of that's kind of a different right. tune. This is... Now this tune talk probably came through the, the uh, southeastern Canada route. It's uh, a little bit Scottish and got a sort of French influence too. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's about the truth of it. 